I am Ingolf Becker. I'm a lecturer in the Jill Dunde Institute of Security and Crime Science as well, um, where we research on anything security related and crime related, from counterterrorism to organized crime to cybercrime. And I have the pleasure of holding, chairing this panel today with, um, well, these three people, Nick Ross uh, from Sanderson House, would you like to join me? Um, you have all the long introductions and um, CVs on the website, so I'm not going to introduce you with too much, too many names. And then Nick Ross, we have next, that was you, sorry, in, <laughs> in Esahin. Um, is our second speaker from, from Federated Hermes International. And lastly, Simon Maple, you've, who you've met already and who has uh, got even more to share. <laughs> um, thank you. Yes, so this is, I'm going to run this as a, quite an open session. So if you have questions, please use the app. So I'm sure you've used, been told this a few times already, the Brella app. Um, at the bottom toolbar, there are three dots um, where you can then go to the Q&A session. And with a bit of luck, if the technology works and nobody puts, well, the wrong questions in here, they will appear on my device. So um, please uh, do ask away our distinguished panel. Right. I'm going to sit down too. So this panel discussion is on deploying new technologies to create an active defense against a cyber crime. And of course, your organizations have lots of experience with these technologies and solutions to cybercrime. So let's start really with the first question. What do you think is the key area that, um, well, the key areas even that need to be addressed in order to develop a robust defense, active defense uh, against cybercrime in your organizations? I'll start with you, Simon. So, yeah, great question. And I'm gonna, uh, I, Every time I get asked a question here, I'm probably just going to jump into the developer aspect to it, but just because I'm the developer in the room. Sounds like a bit like the elephant in the room, right, doesn't it? Um, but the developer in the room, yeah, fr from my point of view, I, I, what I see uh, as one of, the, one of the biggest challenges in terms of organizations being able to adapt to this is going to be um, the security team isn't ever going to be like a huge team. It's never going to expand so that it, at the same scale or rate as developer organization, uh, ops organizations, DevOps organizations. So I think, I think one of the biggest challenges that we face is a cultural one. Um, and I think organizations that are going to be best placed to improve their security posture, improve their security health, are going to be those that, that best uh, adapt to the, the changes that are happening in the way we develop, in the way we deploy uh, our software. So I think those organizations that can instill security into DevOps teams, into developer teams, particularly from, a, from, a, from an AppSec point of view, of course, um, I think those are going to be best positioned in terms of when they're deploying new technologies and things like that. So for me, it's the, it's the developer angle and, and, and introducing security uh, earlier. Well, that does sound a lot like, um, well, behavior change and cultural change rather than technologies. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, in, it, it, certainly it's the hardest thing mm -hmm. to, to, to fix. Um, and as technologies do change, like in my presentation earlier with cloud native um, technologies, as technologies do come in, they either do three things. They either, they either mitigate risk, they introduce new areas of risk, um, or they just shift risk very, very slightly from one problem to another problem. And I think in terms of understanding uh, where the where risk moves from one place to another, I think it's understanding the, in the organization culturally how we as different teams can, can affect that. So, you know, moving to a containers technology is a good example. Um, it, it completely changes the way the organization inside develops and delivers software. And unless the security can also change with that organization. Um, you have developers, you have DevOps teams, and others that aren't on the right page when delivering software in the, in the same way. So that was the, well, developer angle. My, my developer yeah. angle, yes. <laughs> Ines, what do you think? Well, I'm going to second the culture uh, aspect. I, I, I also find that it is probably the key challenge in, in securing things. Uh, apologies if I will use a couple sort of martial arts analogies, but. <laughs> 
sort of in martial arts, the, the fight is not against the opponent, it's the internal struggle. And I find in security, it's pretty much the same thing. It's often not the, the fight against the hackers, but against the internal friction to get the right resources, to get the right support, so that you can enable all those smart and brilliant individuals who work in IT, who work in information security, so that you can use all those brilliant technologies, the cutting edge stuff, until you get the support and the buy-in and the commitment throughout the organization, well, you can't really do much with it. So uh, that, that for me is always the, the biggest emphasis. So, so I can sort of get the buy-in from the organization at all levels, not just the senior management level, but also the frontline engineers who work alongside the InfoSec people. So that if we have the right tools, if we have the right resources, if we have the right funds to actually invest into security, well, the whole thing needs to come together with, with people, process, and technology. So why do you think that is such a struggle? Ah, do you struggle to get by and is the technology not there yet? Is, is, it, is it that you have to prove that it is worth the money or? Well, I think the, the elephant in the room is, we talk about this all the time, it's uh, security versus user convenience. And I'm a security professional. 10 minutes ago, I was trying to reset my password for an app and it was frustrating. It, it's, it's still there and you have to understand that people are still you know, bogged down by this in the organization. And there's also, I, I think it's getting less and less. I think as an industry, we're getting better at actually improving the user convenience elements through some, some developments in technology. I mean, I'm a big fan of mobile application management, for example, and BYOD, but that, a tangent. Um, I think the historical baggage of people having suffered through clunky t uh, technology and clunky IT, it's just a cultural thing. and. Uh, Culture doesn't change overnight. Yeah, thank you. Right, and yeah, Nick? I think, uh, certainly I would echo um, a number of the comments that have been made. I mean, I think certainly, you know, culture is always going to sit um, at, at the centre of any change, evolution within a, within a business. Um, Saunders & House are a financial services organisation and my role is, is around the whole technology enablement piece, including security and other areas, um, sit under my, my, my responsibility and my team's um, elements of, of delivery. Um, and, and actually, I think when you're looking at, at, at this from a, from a cultural perspective, when you're looking at this from an organisational point of view, it is looking at it as an enabler. Um, and trying to identify where those business benefits associated with security come into play. Um, and I think if you're, if you're able to do that, then it makes it ultimately a, a better understood position from a business perspective. And certainly that's where I've focused my attention with the boards and other committees that I've had to uh, engage in this to help them understand where the risks sit. Um, as we were speaking about before, as, a, as an overall firm, and ultimately where we should be focusing our priorities. Um, and to me, that's very much so around a multifaceted approach. The reality is, as we all know, it's never a question of if there's going to be a security breach. It's a question of when there is going to be a security breach and making sure that you can demonstrate when it's appropriate to do so, that you've taken a sensible, appropriate, prioritised approach associated with the activities that you have undertaken with your team, with your resources, with your budget allocation, to focus in the areas which present highest levels of risk to you and your organisation and your firm. So I think there, there are a few factors there, and we could talk about it for the next half an hour or so, I'm sure, but just in summary, there's a few considerations there that I, I would certainly factor into that. So it's not so much about deploying new technologies per se, it is actually the, the technologies that work and actually fit into the organisation. Absolutely, and every organisation is going to be different. Um, and I think it, it is about, as technologists, um, and there'll be, I'm sure, a number in the room physically and virtually today, um, we all get excited by the new toys. Let's, you know, let's, not, let's not lose sight of that. But I think it's incredibly important to make sure that the business skew is put across that, that, that the latest sales pitch that we've received, the latest tool that's gone out there is not necessarily in the business's best interest when you're looking at it from an overall risk perspective and priority point of view. And it is just being able to take that step back sometimes and making sure that you're able to apply that correctly. And that it fits into what the organisation actually wants to achieve. 
I mean, I've researched a couple of organizations and work with them, and there we found that often new technologies just get abandoned because they are not suitable for what is actually needed. So it's going to be interesting. How do you think AI fits into that, AI and machine learning? Um, to me? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Let's, 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 let's kick off. Um, AI and machine learning, I think, I think it's got fantastic potential and I think there's already a number of use cases and I'm not going to mention products and vendors, um, but there are a number that I'm sure we're all aware of that have got some really good early stages evolution of, of that. And ultimately, you know, part and parcel of the challenge with security can be around quantums of information and being proactive, not reactive, when we've got that information being provided to our to our socks and, and everything that sits around that. And I think if you look at that from an AI and machine learning perspective, ultimately it can only start to reduce the risk associated with those key areas that it's working in. But it needs to go through that continual evolutionary journey. And like I said, I think we're relatively early doors in terms of actually being able to, to take full advantage of what I'm sure will become a very, very powerful and almost standardized tool set in the future. Ennis? Well, obviously, AI is a powerful emerging technology, and it's going to be a, a, a great tool for the defensive side of security as well as the offensive side of security. Uh, recently, I was listening to a podcast with Lex Friedman, who's an AI scientist, and Jaco Willink, who's a retired Navy SEAL, and they were talking about the use of AI within military operations. And they were talking about giving the autonomy to AI when it comes to pulling the trigger. And in Western countries, because there's less risk appetite towards collateral damage, uh, countries are still hesitant towards sort of doing that. And there's always a human operator who makes the decision. Whereas in some other countries where there's higher appetite towards collateral damage, they're using the technology to its full potential, or I should say at least, they're more willing to push the envelope. So from a defensive perspective, I suspect we will have less appetite for false positives because if, if the wrong email is blocked, if the wrong TCP stream is disconnected, if the, the wrong server is disconnected from the network, there's going to be a lot of noise in, in, in the business. Yeah. Whereas from an offensive perspective, depending on how spell, stealthy you want to be, if you don't really care about stealth, you can just push the envelope and really try to take advantage of the technology to its fullest potential regardless of the collateral damage. So in that regard, I, I, I fear if the hackers are going to have the edge on us. Yes, I mean, for after analysis after the fact, uh, machine learning and AI and data science tools will probably be very powerful. But yeah, an active deployment in defenses, what is your developer view of that? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we're still a few years out to, 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 to see it, you know, really come in in any, in any force here, but I, I absolutely love it. I think it's a really good, uh, a really good way of looking at things. We, um, what, one of the one of the big issues. In fact, let's take it a step back. What, one of the core things that we want to do within our organisations is year on year, month on month, quarter on quarter, make our security posture better. Okay, we just want we want uh, one of our core goals that we want to measure ourselves on is how can I improve uh, from this month to next month. And I think one of the biggest things around that is, well, we obviously need to make changes in, in, you know, to our applications or our infrastructure or, or, or how we're deploying. And there is so much noise um, and so little signal in, in so much of the information that we have uh, that, that is given to us, whether developers or other parts of the organization, it's very hard to understand, okay, what is the most, what is the, what is the piece if I have you know, 10 hours this week to, to focus on security, what should I focus that time on? And I think it's really, really important, particularly with AI and ML um, um, ways of, you know, looking through the data and identifying, trying to bubble up to the top, what is the core thing I need to work on right now? Where is my highest risks? And I think from my developer point of view, um, yeah, I think you were alluding to it, the developer frustrations that come when you, if you used to give a developer, you know, in the old days where we kind of say, here's an audit before you go to production, and it's like pages and pages of issues that developers need to sift through, and, and it just plain doesn't work. And so what we need to do is really eliminate as much of that noise as we possibly can. And in fact, you know, at Sneak, we're, we're, we created a, a SaaS tool recently, um, which it has an ML core, 
and the way it learns and, uh, and identifies rules, which we still as humans look at, identify and say, yes, this is correct or no, it's not, or, or do a number of cycles to actually create this rule set, that's what eliminates the false positives. And it's, it's a new way of doing SAST. And I think the approach both in our overall um, identification of risk and threat across our organization, as well as the tools we use, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come in multiple ways, but it's a really exciting uh, thing to be added into, into security posture. Mm -hmm. Actually, a question from online, or from the room, I don't actually know. Um, do you think that the technology is ready, well, it's already strong enough to adopt for this new hybrid working environment that we're in? I mean, Moving away from perimeter defenses, which is, of course, very 90s in a sense, um, or 2000s. But um, do you think that the, the hybrid environment gives you new, new challenges here? Yeah, I mean, it absolutely does. Um, it, it, it equally, you know, you see a lot of people who, who as a result of, of having um, dispersed offices or, or moving from place to place, they also think about security a little bit more because they need to identify, uh, you know, th think a little bit more about what they're doing. It absolutely brings additional risk for sure. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely think so. Do you want to add anything, Hannes? Yeah, I, I, I agree with Simon. It, it is a challenge. I feel like part of the challenge is uh, managing the change because if you have a green field, implementation where you said, okay, uh, this is the new lay of the land. This is how my organization is going to adopt hybrid working. You could set everything up from the ground up. Well, you know, it, it, this is not rocket science. It's, it's doable. Uh, the technologies are out there, but I think the, the, the challenge is, well, most organizations are trying to manage a big, big change in terms of culture, operating environment, technologies, and all of these things trying to come together. Uh, there's, there's a lot of friction. There's a lot of challenge in uh, lots of issues to be navigated. Yeah, I think, I think cult culturally is a really important point because, you know, when, when you are all located in the same office and the security team and the dev team, albeit, I don't know, on different floors or whatever, it's, you can walk over to a, security, to a developer team or, or sit down as part of the code review or, or do some threat modeling with the team or something. That, that it, it, just, it just makes it so much harder when that's, when that's separated because you just lose that water cooler moment or, or, or just chatting with different people. So I think the culture of having people in the same place and having those conversations that aren't necessarily as forced, I think that's what that's one of the core things that's missing. Yeah. I wonder if there's any been research on security champions and how they coped in the pandemic because their role was usually very much on the ground. Yes. Uh, yeah, no, that's true. And I think I think it also also depends on the on the programs themselves because mm. very often you still have those meetups or, or chats with those different groups and I think those programs that ha have effectively have people that are running them well and still bring people together it, it, it can still continue but I think the growth of the champions programs probably maybe stutters a little bit. I mean we work in a domain where oh, when, when there is a breach I mean as an academic my work is public anyway so it gets published and it is there to be public and as a software developer you have software that is, uh, of course, if you lose the source code, that wouldn't be great, but it wouldn't be quite the same impact as if a financial institution um, has a big data breach that could bring an organization down. Um, so your view is probably quite different, Nick. I, I, again, I think it comes back down to the individual organization. You're right, different sectors, different organizations will have different perspectives on, on, on this overall, overall piece. Um, for us as a firm, um, We'd taken a fundamental philosophy that meant security was baked in from the ground up. Um, and actually, when the pandemic came along and we shut our offices down, as a lot of organisations did, and all of our staff went to work from home, from an overall security risk from a cyber perspective, it didn't actually increase our risk profile. So our offices are, are actually delivered in the same way as a remote user will be delivered today. Um, so we were we were fortunate from that perspective, forward planning. Uh, I'd like to say it was all, all, all done with, with forward planning, but of course there's an element of consideration in terms of the technology strategy that we took alongside that. But like I said, we definitely always bake security in by design. Um, a key part of that for us, and again, it's unique for each, indi each individual organization, is the consideration of um, virtual desktop infrastructures, which is what we, we utilize. Um, and that is, 
a, a significant enabler to that flexibility from a security perspective and making sure that our data never actually physically leaves our data centers. So we haven't got that consideration around um, the, the cloud, the public cloud, as it, as it were, the, the considerations around the local movement of data, as some organizations obviously did have, um, and, and I'm sure still do, during this process. Um, but I think, uh, ultimately, I think if we look at the, the remote working and hybrid model, that we're all, I, I suspect the high majority of, certainly office-based businesses are gonna have moving forward, um, there's got to be lessons that it can be taken from those organizations who have been working in that way for a long time. Um, and if we look at the international businesses, the businesses that significantly outsource to remote uh, locations, whether they be around Europe, uh, Australasia, wherever it may be, they've been working in that way for a long time. And the cultural considerations, whether they be around security, whether they be around working practice, et cetera, are things that I think we're all gonna be able to take opportunities to learn from and potentially downscale to the size and shape of organization that we are. So I don't think it's necessarily something which is new, but maybe some of the existing lessons that have been taken from other organizations can be applied to us in a different way. I mean, I think the panel is quite, or the four of us are quite, uh, come from very diverse organizations that manage it very differently. I mean, your developers in your organization, they don't remo use remote desktops or VPNs, do they? No, I mean, we, we obviously have, you know, we have, Customer data. We have we have our source, which obviously means it means a lot to us an equal uh, amount. But uh, but yeah, I mean we'll have you know, different VPNs and things to access various things like that. But uh, but but yeah, it's a, I think it's a, a different approach or a different yeah. uh, a different problem slightly. And how um, how machine learning fits into various of these aspects is kind of, is very interesting as yeah. the intrusion detection models can really do uh, work. I think. Um, a question, another question online is, is teaching staff how to be more aware of cyber attacks just as important as implementing, implementing the latest tech? And I think we have already kind of touched upon that a few times, that unless you really get your cyber, your technology integrated in a business so that an ordinary user can use it and is aware of its benefits and its costs, um, then you will struggle. So, um, I mean, okay, okay, there might be a technology which is entirely in the back end, but... Um, yeah, I mean, if I, maybe I'll, I'll comment on that if that's okay. I mean, I think f for me, the, the education and culture of the organization is critical, but it's almost the last line of defense. So if you think about it from a, from a threat vector perspective, we've all got lots of layers of protection in place, whether we think about them as, as individual technologies or whether we think about them overall. So that ultimately, the, the, an external party coming into the organization is hopefully technically swore, uh, stopped before they can actually reach the end user or the, or the data or whatever else it may be. And the same thing in terms of some of the inter internal processes. But ultimately people, even with machine learning and AI at this point in time, people are always gonna be the last line of defense. Somebody will see something if it looks wrong and you'd hope that as part and part of the education process you take them through, they will either take the appropriate step to stop that or ultimately they've reported to somebody so that they can look into that in further detail. And a good example of that is email. You follow the route of email through, it should go through many different layers before it reaches the end user to actually open up an attachment which could contain ransomware, potentially, um, and, and release it into the, into the environment. So education, absolutely, I'm a massive advocate of it and I think it's an, Im an imperative part of security. Um, but ultimately, it's supporting and acting as that last line of defense. That's interesting because I tend to see uh, the, the human element of security as the first line of defense and technology almost picking up the slack. Um, and, and when it comes to user education, we, we focus a lot on phishing and email-based threat vectors. Uh, I think about a project manager who bypasses the security review, uh, an engineer who bypasses the change management process. I feel like the education is probably going to be a bit more impactful when it comes to stuff like that. I mean, fishing, you know, there's only so much training you can do, and then there's only a level of awareness people will have during the day when they're busy, ton of stuff happening. You know, even if you ha have uh, the daily security awareness training, if you're busy, your wife's on the phone, something going on, you know, you can just click on an email. It could happen, right? Um, I, I, from an awareness point of view, I would like to focus efforts on 
corporate level awareness, as in what are the processes that you should follow, what, 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 what's the sensitivity of the data that you are working with, are you aware that it's your data, not InfoSec's data, are you aware of your responsibilities when it comes to working with data, working within a governance structure, um, and then technology is sort of in the background, picking up slack when people make errors, ah, change management, well you haven't actually uh, received approval from so-and-so. It's, it's almost like supportive, at least from my perspective. I think it's a mixture of the two, because they are both the first and the last uh, defense. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say, despite being at a panel and not wanting to agree with two people that are disagreeing, uh, both <laughs> of you, uh, maybe I should just disagree with both of you then, just to make it a bit interesting. Um, yeah, I, I think there are different types of education that can, some of which can be first line, some of which we can be last line. So to take the developer stance again, um, you know, m me as a developer, I don't care about deep security, all right? So I don't want to know the ins and outs of security. What I do want to know about is secure development. And the two, are, security and secure development should be treated as different things. So me, me as a developer, I, I, I want to deliver some code or I want to, I want to deliver my feature. Um, I want to do it in a secure way, um, but I don't want to know about everything there is to know about security. Now, we very often as organizations give out huge amounts of security education that no one wants to do, it's quite dull, and you end up just clicking through and then filling out your best guess answers and hitting finish. Um, that's great as a general security, and it, and it works well for people who are security curious, people who want to, to know those kind of things. But when a developer is, you know, let's say, let's say a developer switches to containers or server, or let's say containers, there is an insecure default there, maybe. Um, how is a developer going to find that insecure default? Is it because they're going to think back to their training, or is it because they have something that tells them that that insecure default exists, and then using secure development practices goes ahead, to fi goes ahead and fixes it? So I think we need a general level of security education as our first line of defense so that we are aware as to, as to you know, potential risks and things like that. But then I think we need this last line of defense whereby things get flagged to us, and whether we use tooling or, or other things, uh, code reviews, those kind of things to, to, to flag those, and then education at the time to say, here is a specific issue that you've got, here is some education on it so you can read up and learn a little bit about it, and this is how you can fix it. And I think that's how you get the kind of like, you know, the last line of defense against, this is about to go out and we need to fix it, or the, you know, you're, you're writing something uh, insecure here. I mean, your employees are your probably the most important asset of the organization, so they deserve to be treated that way, and um, they can make the difference. And you, your role is going to determine things differently as well, and your interests. You know, there are going to be those people who have got an absolute interest in this from a personal perspective, from a corporate point of view, whatever else it may be, and they're going to be absolute advocates of it, and they're definitely going to be the people who are going to be maybe thinking about that from a first-line perspective. Um, but you've also got those who are less interested, um, and actually you're just going to want to have that core foundation. And I think, again, from, a, from an educational perspective, it's making it personally relatable. And actually, I think when we, certainly when we've gone through our education programs, that's been one of the key things that's made more people engage with it. If I do this at home, actually it's going to improve my overall personal security and, and considerations. The fact that it's got a, down, a, a, a knock on impact from a corporate perspective, I think is, is almost for, that, for some people by the by, um, which is an interesting dynamic. Just coming in, um, what is your view on awareness versus training? What do you consider um, the benefits of awareness or is awareness just a buzzword that uh, leads to more substantiated, substantial development and substantial uh, teaching? Anyone strong views on, um, on it? I'm, I'm, happy to com I'm happy to comment on anything at the end of the day, so I'm here. Um, I think, look, I think you've got to have a fundamental understanding and awareness of why security is important. Mm. Um, and then ultimately, I think the, the, the training elements associated with that maybe become more specific, uh, maybe pick up on specific areas that are relevant, again, to your role, to your individual, to your firm, um, to your regulatory needs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but ultimately, if you don't understand what you're learning about from a core awareness perspective, you've got no context. And, and I think that's, that's why awareness is, is supported by training. 
Okay. And of course, training builds a degree of awareness as well. So you can't have, it's almost a chicken and egg question yes. to a degree. Um, I've done research with a colleague on uh, in software developers in a much more agile way of delivering security training to them. And we found that actually most employees of an organization, even not just the, the developers, were very much aware of what the potential risks were, and, um, but didn't actually understand how their role fitted into that protecting thing. So it's kind of enabling the individuals very much to, um, to deliver to something. So it's not just, yeah, I, don't like, I personally don't like the term awareness because it just seems to shout at people here, be aware of something, but it doesn't actually allow you to do something and yeah. do something Effective. Yeah, and that, that was kind of what I was going to pick up on. Awareness is great, but it's like if you if you leave the room and say, "Oh, can you can you watch that pan of boiling water?" You know, you, the awareness there is just to watch that pan of boiling water boil dry, right? That, that that's awareness. Uh, but the the training, the actual actionable thing that you want to improve on, mm. that that that's ultimately what you need the training for. So the awareness, uh, I agree, the training follows the awareness. So it's like having awareness into into where issues exist, into that into almost like dashboards of what you need to where where your risk and where your pain points are, the training backs that up. And the right level of, I think, I think it was mentioned here uh, earlier, in terms of when you educate, it needs to be education that the person who is learning from can actually relate to. Um, so if it's a developer or a DevOps person or a platform person or a security person, it needs to be it needs to be training dedicated to that person so they can relate to it and they can understand what they need to understand. Otherwise, trainings are just very can be very very ineffective. I feel we're leaving the topic of the te 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 panel discussion a little bit. We've not talked about technologies very much. <laughs> um, do you think a technology plays a role in this training? Or I, I personally do. I mean, I think um, understanding understanding where your risk can come from. Let's take an example of something like a serverless technology versus a container or a cloud technology. Um, if you look at something that's serverless, you have different risk areas to that. So. If something's serverless, you know, your operating system is, is handled by a vendor potentially, your network security is handled by a vendor, your, you know, a, a lot more is taken care of. So you need to understand when using a technology where your risks for that technology uh, are going to exist and what is effectively a shared responsibility um, between you and a vendor. So if you take uh, you know, Lambdas, for example, um, what is the developer, or what is the what is you, the the person pushing that into production, need need to care about? And I think technology absolutely plays a part in that. Not just from what you're putting out, but from the other side, how are you going to remediate? How are you going to, if there is a security issue, what do you need to do? So with containers, they're very easy to spin up and just you know pull things down, create new containers, spin things up. It affects the training as well in terms of what we need to do when when issues exist. So. Um, yeah, technology is a big part of that. Um, That's more the technology in, like, in the implementation side, but not so much in the training and in the education and in the actually active defense of, of it, mm -hmm. like technologies that uh, give just-in-time training, I guess. Um, actually, I'm not familiar with many vendors on that topic at all. Um, Awareness training, just, just maybe to com comment on it before we move on to the technology element, but uh, I feel like awareness and training, the difference is knowledge versus skills. And with skills, I don't necessarily mean the skills of knowing how to do a pen test, whatever, but the skills of having the instinct to default to a security way of doing things. Um, and and you, you made a great point, which made me think, well, we don't really utilize technology to enforce behaviors and to build skill. So I'm just thinking about some of the email products that I use. You were, use the word attachment. You haven't attached the file pop-up that says, well, please remember to do that. I wonder if there are things that could be explored in this sort of space to sort of reinforce certain things that could sort of push people towards building those instincts or behaviors or skills. Uh, just very a, interesting point. Just a reminder that you have put 500 people in the in the to address list. Do you want to move them to the BCC field? Would we'll probably solve a lot of <laughs> problems. Yeah. Technology and training, um, I think, go hand in hand. Um, quite honestly, and I think actually, um, and we've done a lot of a lot of work in this area over the last few years. Um, I think it can fundamentally change your engagement and your culture if you get it right, and again, make it appropriate. But the technology tools that have enabled for that to occur, I think, are evolving rapidly. 
Um, and there's, I'm sh there's quite a number of vendors out there who, who offer some really good products now. Um, and by that, if we go back in time, and, and maybe some of your organizations are still doing this, um, you'd, you'd end up going through your standard annual, maybe refresher, computer-based training uh, tool with a series of 10 questions that within a few days everybody would know the answers to and they'd be sharing amongst themselves. You wouldn't really be learning anything from that. And then come a few weeks later, a lot of people have forgotten it. Now those types of almost, dare I say, it, sheep dip approach um, to tick a box and maybe meet with a regulatory requirement or whatever else may be required, I don't think are conducive to modern technology and modern ways of thinking. There are a number of tools out there now which really make it much more engaging, much more personable, much more regular, much more tailored. And actually, when, it, when, you, when you build up a profile associated, and this is where technology I think is very powerful and from a training perspective, build up a, a profile associated with the user's education, where their strengths and their weaknesses are, and you can focus your training associated with where that individual needs their roles to align with, with a specific skill set and they're showing a weaker area, and the tool does it by itself, brilliant. And there are tools out there now that are starting to do that. So I think that's where technology becomes a true te uh, training enabler. I'm not aware of those technologies or those, the, of those vendors. So if you're one of them, I would like to know about it. <laughs> <laughs> More from an academic interest, um, but it is, uh, sounds like uh, very revolutionary. Uh, thank you for all the questions online and in person. I am scrolling through them and trying to find those that I uh, suit the conversation best. Uh, but on this topic, actually, have you been overwhelmed by any of the new technologies or that you've been approached with or that have been pitched at you? And uh, is there some like uh, things that where you actually, how do you approach sometimes uh, these very elaborate, very, compl com, um, very complex um, technologies that, that, uh, might, that people want to sell you? Um, I think for me, it's a question of, of business case and understanding, and it comes back down to that original assessment. Mm. Understanding as a business, where do your risks sit? There's always gonna be somebody out there who's gonna have a new idea, a new fandangled technology, which is absolutely superb, and I'm sure we could always make a business case for it. But ultimately, you need to understand, again, where your, where your risk sits, and then it's about shopping for what you need. Yes, of course, keep an eye out in terms of what's going on, what the evolving technologies and the evolving threat landscape looks like. This space is almost like a, an arms race. I think somebody described it to me once upon a time, and it's a fair point, it is. So of course, it's always good to keep a, a, a watching brief on that, but ultimately just keep an eye on what, you're, what you truly need as a business and where your risks are exposed and focus your attentions there, not on what the, the new Fandangle tool may be and the salesman has tried to sell you. Ennis? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. It, it's difficult because there, there are lots of new technologies and some of them could be quite revolutionary, quite the, all of a sudden become the industry standard. E EDR, I mean, 10 years ago, e EDR wasn't really a thing. Now it is, you know, it's like antivirus, everyone's got EDR. Um, but how do you pick up on a new technology that's going to become the new norm early enough and start the adoption? How do you get the buy-in? How do you explain it to the people who are going to actually fund uh, the rollout of that technology in your organization to say, look, this is not just the latest and greatest, but this is actually going to be the thing. Um, yeah, maybe I'm too focused on uh, the bean counters, but I feel like you know, that, th that solves a lot of issues. If you can get, get, uh, if you can get the buy-in from those individuals, if you can get them on the case, then th the rest becomes a, re a relatively simpler challenge. I mean, security, you only see the value to it when, some, when things go wrong. So if your technologies work correctly and nothing goes wrong, then you have to a difficult case necessary, or in some cases to well, justify that investment. So is it just hype? How much hype do you think is there? I mean, in the, in the software development thing, there's so many new things coming along every, all, the all the time. Yeah. How do you decide? Well, yes, yeah, great question. And I, th and I think that the, the speed at which I, I really like the, you know, the business case is, is there's got to be a business case for a tool. And I think the, the speed at which you adopt security technology needs to match the speed at which you're adopting technology as an organization. So if you're adopting different technologies, you know, in your, in your production environments, et cetera, 
then you need to be able to almost match that either with existing tools that you have or identify gaps that you have with the new technologies in terms of, okay, how can I, like a lot of people adding infrastructure as code technology, big gap for misconfigurations. Mm. Is that a gap that we're handling now? If not, we need to create a business case and we need to identify how we can mitigate that, that, that risk. Um, so one of the things that we see a lot is uh, many of our customers very, very keen on consolidation. So getting the right tools, but being if you can get four tools from a single vendor, it doesn't just it doesn't just make it easier from a kind of like a vendor list point of view, but from an adoption point of view of the actual users of that tool, the fact that they've got similar UIs, the fact that they've got similar you know experiences, that can help a lot as well. Um, plus, obviously, you have that any trust that you build up, it, it grows across products. So, I think from the technology point of view, consolidation is very important, um, but also yeah, very much that 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 finding the use case, the the the, the business case needs to be there. Now, what do you see as the new rising threats that uh, are coming and into your organizations? I mean, ransomware is not a rising threat really anymore. It's, it's rising, <laughs> but it has been there for a long time. Do you see anything new on the horizon that, uh, that uh, worries you? Um, I, I, think, I, I think we, see, we, we can see growth in certain areas, nothing, nothing that's revolutionary. I mean, I think that there have been a number of you know, supply chain risks, not just in, in libraries mm. uh, that we've seen in third party packages, as an example, but beyond that, third party, uh, supply chain issues we've uh, go way beyond uh, open source libraries um, and and you know we've seen a number including one of microsoft's uh, most well used ide uh, as, the, as a as a potential luckily it was a security researcher that found it but as a potential problem in the actual software that developers are writing code in um, i think supply chain issues are definitely uh, a growing threat um, uh, other than that i think Areas which, are, as I mentioned previously, are doing a shift from one group to another. I harp back on misconfigurations. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a massive risk that isn't isn't an overly complex problem to to uh, to at least get awareness of. Um, I think misconfigurations, as well as supply chain, are two two very fast increasing uh, issues that we need to challenge. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, what do you I think? I second Simon on uh, supply, chain, uh, supply chain risk management. I think it is going to be uh, a hot topic for especially financial services industry where we are having more and more reliance on certain big tech companies for their cloud environments. Um, and you know, my, Microsoft, you know, uh, the, the hack the, that they suffered uh, with their exchange uh, environment and, and the, the SolarWinds hack uh, earlier this year, again, to just demonstrate the extent of this problem and the difficulty in tackling the problem. It's, it's not so much about uh, emerging attack vectors on specific technology, but just the fact that you rely on these third parties and you know, operational due diligence processes can mitigate risk to a certain extent, but when there, there are good products, good vendors that you know is the, the industry sort of leader and there's going to be more and more organizations going towards them, well, you know, they, they become attractive targets, so. Yeah, especially if the diversity disappears and people use the same monoculture in all organizations, then, yeah, I know a lot of people that argue for more diversity in back-end infrastructure in so, uh, and cloud providers in email providers. Um, two very quick things from, from me. I think, um, and I'm not necessarily saying the reflective of us as a firm, but just as a, an overall uh, threat vector for all of us. One is around internal threat. Ultimately, attackers will always go for the, the softer link, uh, the softer, softer shell, if you like, and, and, and that, is, that is clearly a factor that uh, needs to be considered. Um, and I think the other thing that we need to be mindful of is we're all putting a lot of data into the cloud, a lot of systems and, and reliance upon a number, of, a small number of dedicated suppliers, which is great. And you know, there's a lot of benefits associated with that. But also, if there's a compromise associated with, with that, that may mean that a lot of us have an issue in one hit, as opposed to smaller, uh, discrete pillows of, of, of activity. So I think that's something else we just need to be mindful of. Um, not that anything's happened, 
but who knows what the future holds. Well, thank you, Nick, Ennis, Simon. Um, that concludes our panel discussion on developing new technologies to create an active defense against cybercrime. Thank you very much.